Welcome to Bible Trivia. This time we'll be asking Guess Who questions. The first question for 100 points. In the Bible, this person builds a huge boat. Is it A, Moses, B, Jonah, C, Noah, or D, Elijah? The answer is C. In the Bible, Noah builds a huge boat. The next question for 200 points. He is a shepherd who used a slingshot to stop a giant. Is it A, Jacob, B, David, C, John, or D, Joshua? The answer is B. David is a shepherd who used a slingshot to stop a giant. The next question for lots and lots of points. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. Is it A, three Hebrew boys, B, three wise men, C, three Galileans, or D, three Babylonians? The answer is A. Three Hebrew boys were thrown into a fiery furnace. The next question for one half of a point. He delivered the Ten Commandments from God. Was it A. Elijah, B. Jacob, C. Moses, or D. Andrew? The answer is C. Moses delivered the Ten Commandments from God. The next question for 500 points. She is the mother of Jesus. Is it A. Mary, B. Joanna, C. Anna, or D. Esther? Esther. The answer is A. Mary is the mother of Jesus. The next question for supercalifragilistic number of points. He is Esau's twin brother. Is it A. Isaac, B. Jacob, C. David, or D. John? The answer is B. Jacob is Esau's twin brother. The next question for 1,000 points. She talks to a snake. Is it A. Eve, B. Ruth, C. Mary, or D. Joanna? The answer is A. It's Eve who talks to a snake. The next question for a dozen points. He walks on water. Is the answer A. Matthew, B. Paul, C. James, or D. Jesus? The answer is D. Jesus walks on water. The next question for 800 points. He is a king known for his wisdom. Is it A. David, B. Solomon, C. Josiah, or D. Saul?
The answer is B. King Solomon was known for his wisdom. Now the last question for double your current points. He was swallowed by a great fish. Is it A, Noah, B, Jonah, C, Aaron, or D, Adam? The answer is B. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Thanks for playing Bible Trivia. We hope you'll play again soon. Hey church, this is Dan. I'm actually here in our streaming room. I'm really excited to be uh, worshiping with you online virtually today. Um, we have a great uh, service uh, in store for you. Um, Pastor Eric's going to be leading us in worship, and we really encourage you as you're in your home that you would worship together and just sing out. And as Dee shared um, on Facebook earlier this week, that if you have instruments in your home, encourage your students to play instruments, to sing, and to dance. Um, this is going to be an exciting time of worship. Pastor Dee's going to have a, uh, a message for our children, so make sure they're in the room and they're ready for that as well. And then Pastor Adrian is going to share again from his heart, just again about what's going on in this world and sort of what it means to take the long view. At the end of the service, we're going to celebrate communion. And um, as Pastor Adrian shared in our weekly newsletter this week, um, you can uh, prepare by having some bread and some grape juice um, in your home. If you don't have those items, um, Pastor Adrian will still walk us through what to do there. We, for example, you can substitute with water. Um, but we, we don't want you to stress about the elements, but instead focus on the idea that you're going to be able to celebrate communion with your family, um, both in your home um, and then also collectively with your church family um, as we do that together, again, as we join virtually online today. We're going to continue to leverage technology this week. Our, our, we'll have virtual youth group again uh, tomorrow, Sunday at 5 p.m. The details to connect are right there on your screen and will be shared with parents via email and text as well. Also, our men's Bible study has switched over to Zoom so that they're not going to miss a beat. Our Friday morning men's Bible study, that's at Friday at 7 a.m. And again, details on your screen, but also you're able to, um, to connect to that um, using the instructions that are being the weekly email as well. So take a look at that if you're planning on joining that on Friday at 7 a.m. We have a blood drive coming up. The Red Cross has a desperate critical need for blood right now based on this national pandemic. And so we're going to be having a blood drive on April 3rd from noon to 5 here at the church. And so if you are willing to um, sign up for that and to donate blood, um, instructions are there on your screen. And you can also text the word DRIVE to 919-739-3423. That's the word DRIVE to 919-739-3423. You'll receive a link to register for the blood drive. Registration um, is required, and so we ask that you take a moment to do that. Over 20 individuals have already signed up, and we're so excited that um, the response has been so great throughout the community. It's never too late to start thinking about Vacation Bible School and putting um, that date on your calendar. It's going to be August 2nd to the 6th. And this year, um, which is awesome to, to, to coincide with our theme here at the church with construction going on with our Children's Center, our theme is Construction to Cranes. And so save those dates August 2nd to 6th. It's something our children can really look forward to here for, uh, for the next few months. And if you're willing to volunteer or serve in any way to support Vacation Bible School, would you shoot an email to d at northsidecommunity.com. That's d at northsidecommunity.com again, and you can serve and support Vacation Bible School here at Northside, which serves our uh, children as well as children from around the community. And finally, I want to encourage you to um, utilize Right Now Media as you are um, spending more time at home. And Right Now Media uh, is referred to kind of the Christian Netflix. Amazing Bible studies and programming. There's also children's programming on there as well, um, as well as a lot of resources for our youth and our students. And so if you don't have access to Right Now Media, can you shoot an email to Angela at northsidecommunity.com and just request access. It's free for you, and we'd love to provide that to you as a resource. And finally, if you're looking to make an online gift today, the easiest way to do that is through the Northside Alexio app right there on your phone um, and hit the, the Give button at the bottom of the uh, home screen. And then if you don't have the Alexio app on your phone, um, you can shoot uh, a text message using the word keyword GIVE to 919-739-3423. You will then receive a secure link to make your donation online. 
And we always encourage you each week to take a moment, fill out a connect card. If you have information that you want to share with us, if your um, contact information has changed, if you'd like to be added to our uh, weekly newsletter, um, if you are looking to connect in a way and join a new group or maybe even join a serve team, uh, we encourage you to fill out a connect card. And we've made that digital uh, for times such as these. So if you're looking to fill out that online connect card, just shoot that word connect uh, to the number on your screen. And again, all those keywords today, drive, if you're looking to, um, to, uh, to, to give blood and to participate in the blood drive, um, and also the words give and connect. Um, any of those words, those keywords will work for that number today, and we're really looking forward to connecting with you live. It looks like it is time for worship here, so um, we're going to uh, just uh, ask that you continue to gather around your homes and uh, prepare your hearts for worship as Pastor Eric uh, prepares to lead us. We're so glad that you're here. Good morning, church. I encourage wherever you are this morning, in your living rooms, on the way to the grocery store, whatever it may be, whatever your week's been like, let's sing these songs together and proclaim the truths in the midst of uncertainty, knowing that God is faithful to do what he promises.
Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. A God of wonders, you reign. A God of wonders, you reign. Sing loud, church. You are the Lord Almighty. I'll shine in all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. You are the Lord Almighty. I'll shine in all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Testament reading for this morning comes from Psalm 130. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. 
Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept the record of sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. And our New Testament reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Beginning in chapter 8, verses 6 through 11. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. declare this together this morning, church. Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life, from beginning to the end, I can trust you. In your never failing love, you work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. Arms, all the pieces of my life from beginning to the end. I can trust you in your never failing love. You work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. All my hopes, all I need. Held in your hands all my life, all of me. Held in your hands all my fears, 
and all my dreams held in your hands. All my hopes, all I need held in your hands. All my life, all of me held in your hands. All my fears, all dreams held in your hands. In your everlasting arms are the pieces of my life from beginning to the end. I can trust you. In your never failing love, you God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. God, whatever comes our way, we will trust you. God, whatever comes our way, we will trust you. darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. You. you are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, you're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. 
That is who you are That is who you are Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, never stop working You never stop, never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, never stop working You never stop, never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working Working, you never stop, never stop working, you never stop, never stop working, even when I don't see it, you working, even when I don't feel it, you working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working, we make a miracle work, a promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are You are a way maker, a miracle worker A promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are 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 Touching every life, I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're meeting every need. I worship you. I worship you. I thank you for in the times that we feel like no one cares for us. Or we feel like we're all alone. May we always remember that you're present with us. And that your our suffering is your suffering. And you hurt for us. We see that in Christ. Help us to know, as we read in the psalm this morning, that your unfailing love is always quick to snatch us out of whatever depths we find ourselves in. That the Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead is living within us so that we may look at every situation of sorrow and suffering, doubt and fear and we may live and proclaim your joy in the midst of it for you're the author and giver of life you alone sustain it in the times there seems no way forward God you are a way maker and keep your promises. Help us to keep our eyes on you and the hope that we have and the promise that you have given us that you will never leave us. You will never abandon us. But you're faithful to show up all around us in creation in the kindness of our neighbors and the person checking us out at the grocery store. Lord, help us to be beacons of light and hope. Always. Not just in times where we're hurting and suffering, but God, help us to look to the needs of the people around us. That we may direct them to the light of the world. For you call us to be that city on a hill. So we pray this morning 
that your kingdom would come and be present among us as your church gathers throughout the world this morning in worship, lifting our voices and our hearts together. We pray that you would make us one. We pray for those who are hurting and those who are sick. We pray that you would bring healing and provision for them, for those just having a hard time in this season of solitude. That God, you would bring them comfort and the people around them that are reaching out to them in ways that they may have not have ever experienced before. Thank you for technology. We lift up the church, universal, for those who are being persecuted, for those who are in dangerous places this morning. We lift them before your face and pray that you would bring strength, perseverance, and protection. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit that connects us even closer than blood. Closer than our eyes can see. Thank you, God, for being with us in every situation. Help us never to forget your presence. I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, we make a we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. A miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh God, we lift these things before your face in the name of the Father in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and all the church said, amen. Hey kids, I'm so glad that we get to be together this morning. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for leading us in worship. It's so good for us to sing praises to God together. Um, I brought some binoculars today. Do any of you all have binoculars at home? Have you ever used these in nature to see things up close? or maybe at the zoo to focus in on one animal. Um, today, Pastor Adrian is teaching us about thinking about the long view. He's gonna talk about what it means to look to the future and not just what is happening right now. So when I think about the long view and our current situation of sickness and social distancing, I try to think about it from God's perspective and it helps me to have a better perspective. This time of social distancing and being at home will only be for a short time. It will pass. We have to keep our mind focused on God and having an eternal perspective. So rather than taking my binoculars and focusing on what I'm missing or what is difficult, I need to change my perspective to focus on what God is doing. Maybe I can think about it like this. How is God using this time to teach me about him? How is God using this time to teach me to be more like Jesus? I'm going to look at a verse in Colossians. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 gives us a really good reminder. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, 
set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand, in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. So I want us to take just a moment. I want you to close your eyes. Go ahead and close your eyes with me. And think about what it looks like for Jesus to be sitting right beside God in that um, seat of honor to the right of him. Think about what heaven will be like when we get to dwell with God, where there's no pain, no tears, no worries. We're there with God. Now open your eyes. Isn't that comforting? Doesn't that help change your perspective a little bit? I hope that this week, if you start to feel worried or frustrated or sad or angry, that you will take time to ask God to help you to change your perspective, that you'll see things from his perspective, that this time right now that we're experiencing is short and that God is still at work even through this situation. Ask him to remind you of some of the truths that we know about him. God is with us, God loves us, and God will never leave us. There's another verse in Philippians that helps us to know what we are supposed to think about. Philippians 4 verse 8 says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these. I know that um, some of you kids know that we've learned a song that has these lyrics um, from the verse uh, set to music. And so I want you to um, sing with me what those words are, okay? So sing along with me. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure, if it is lovely, if it is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, I'll think on these. Will you sing it with me one more time? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and pure, if it is lovely, if it is admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, I'll think on these. I hope this week that that will be a reminder to you of where your thoughts need to be and how we can ask God to give us an eternal perspective. Let's listen to Pastor Adrian as he teaches us more about this. Good morning, Northside. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Just to let you know off the bat, we sure do miss seeing you. And uh, I, I hope that this is, has been as close as, as possible to us gathering as the church. I hope it's been a blessing to you. One of the things you may have noticed this morning is that our, our worship team was minimized down to one. And so much of that is rooted in uh, what we are receiving in terms of instruction and, and guidance from the governor and, and the idea of sheltering in place. And, and so, I, again, just want you guys to know how much we miss you, how much we're looking forward to the day of, of being able to gather again physically for worship. But in the meantime, I hope God is speaking to you right where you are. I hope that you're feeling the Holy Spirit work in your life as we sing songs together, as we pray together, that you would be able just to sense that God is working and, and moving amongst you. We're going to be in Numbers 27 this morning. Numbers 27, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. And this might be a story that you've heard before, but if you haven't, I hope that the way in which we are talking about it today may speak to where you and, and so many of us are today. In Numbers 27, starting at verse 12, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain in the Barim range and see the land that I have given to the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my commands to honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and to come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. 
you read that, and one of the things that you, you see is, is Moses in, in this time in his life being told that he is going to be able to go up and, and see the promised land, and yet he's not going to be able to enter it. This week at work, I had the chance to visit with a, a lot of patients, and many of them asked a similar question. And, and the question related to this time that we're in right now, and here was the question, and it, it, it ranged in various forms, but it was all asked pretty much the same way. When do you think this will be over? And I'll confess to you, that's a question we're asking in our whole household. That's a question that so many people I know are asking. When do you think this will be over? It's a question that many people are asking. Our political leaders, our medical leaders, all of them are, are trying to give us ideas of, of when we think this thing's going to end. We continue to see extensions on sheltering in place and quarantining ourselves. We hear our president say that he wants the economy to be back open by Easter. And at the same time, we hear people tell us that this thing could go on throughout the summer or throughout the fall. There's so much contrasting information out there that it is really hard to know what to think. If you watch the news this morning, you know that cases here in North Carolina are on the rise. You know that cases throughout the United States are on the rise. And so there, there's something, at least inside of me, that says, I, I'm not even sure we've hit the max yet, much less giving thought to when this might be over. Thinking about all of this, I've been given a lot of thought to, to what it means to take the long view. I, I don't know if that's a term you're familiar with, and that might even seem a little difficult to even think about when you look at everything that we're facing right now. When you look at, at having to spend a, a large amount of time in your home, away from friends and away from your schoolmates and away from your colleagues, it may be hard to think about when you're, you're missing your church community and you're not able to hug those people that are part of the family of God. It may be hard to think about when you're jockeying for meat and milk in the grocery store. It may be difficult to think about when you're having to avoid getting close to people out in the community. But there is something to the life of a believer, of getting a, a, above the fray, if you will, and, and asking yourself, what is the long view? What, what is it that's going on here? What does it mean to take the long view? I, I suppose if you're someone who invests in the stock market or if you're someone who has retirement, to take the long view is, is to take financial advisors' advice to not panic when the stock market goes down. To take the long view as a, as a parent is when your, your child comes home or your teenage student comes home and, and they've just had their first serious breakup in a relationship and they're devastated by it, and yet you're encouraging them to, to take the long view, to recognize that this isn't going to be the last relationship they've had. Merriam-Webster describes taking the long view as this, to think about things that might happen in the future rather than only thinking about the things that are happening right now. To think about things that are happening off into the future, rather than just concentrating on what's happening right now. How hard is that to do? I'll tell you that, that for my family, for myself, even as a pastor of a church, I've really been trying to think about the long view in this season that we're in right now. So many commentators are, are telling us that things are going to change, and I, I suspect they're probably right. I think when we get on the other side of this, things are going to look a lot different for us as individuals, for us as a church community, for, for our nation, for our world. But what will be different? Well, all of a sudden, we have this, this desire to have much more personal interaction with one another because we have been so isolated Will we have a deeper appreciation for our church community and prioritizing worship gatherings because we've, we've missed them so much? As we see sickness continuing to rise, and, and certainly with that, as we see the number of deaths continue to escalate, are we going to have a, a, a thankfulness and a value for human life? I, I don't begin to know what will change. It's hard to know, but I look at what's happening in Numbers 27, and I, I get the sense that there's some correlation to where we are right now. To paint the context for you, Moses has been leading the children of Israel for over 40 years. 
He has led them through grumblings. He has led them through revolts. He has led them through his brother's death, his wife's death. He has led them through wars and attacks and rebellion. Moses has been with these people for 40 years. And God takes him up on a mountain and he shows Moses the promised land. And he, and he tells Moses, Moses, this is, this is the inheritance. This is everything you and the Israelite people have been journeying towards. But, but here's the thing. You're not going to see it. You're not going to go in to the promised land. And, and God tells us why. You, you look at what's happening here, and it almost, to me, feels like God might be rubbing Moses' face in it a little bit. Moses has been working so hard for all these years to lead these people, and God takes Moses up and allows him to see it, but then tells him, you're not going to get to enjoy it. You're not going to be able to be a part of it. It might seem like God's rubbing his face in it a little bit, but, he, but he's not. This story is so important in Scripture that it's told four different times. One time here in Numbers, three times in Deuteronomy. And one of the things that we know is that this is Moses' last message to the, to the people of Israel where he commissions Joshua as the next leader. I believe what God is wanting Moses and the people to understand is, is why judgment is being meted out. Why is it that Moses can't go into the promised land? Why is it that Moses has to die up on the mountain rather than leading these people on and then passing away in this land that God was going to give him. Well, verses 13 and 14 tell us exactly why you read it. And God has taken Moses up onto this mountain, and he tells them this, after you've seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. In essence, you're going to, you're going to die up on this mountain. For when the community rebelled at the waters and the desert of Zen, both of you, talking about Moses and Aaron, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. Now, you might be wondering, what is the sin? What is the disobedience that, that Moses did? If you go back in Scripture, one of the things that you'll see is as Moses was leading the people, there were times where they would call out, where they were hungry or they were thirsty or they needed some provisions in their life, and God was always faithful to them, like he is to us now. He was faithful to them. On one occasion, God tells Moses when the people were thirsty to, to strike a rock and the waters would come forward from it. And, and Moses does that. Moses goes and he strikes the rock and all of a sudden the waters start coming forth and the people are satisfied for a season. You fast forward a, a couple of times later in Scripture and, and a similar incident is happening. The people are grumbling. I'm sure Moses was getting frustrated with it. God tells him, come and speak to the rock. Don't, don't strike it, speak to it. Because in many ways, that rock represented God's presence. That rock represented God's provisions for the people. But instead, Moses leaned on what he knew. He leaned on what he had experienced before. And instead of speaking to the rock as he was told, the Bible tells us that he takes it and he strikes the rock. Going, going against what God had said. Now, that might not seem like a, a big deal, but I, I think in a lot of ways, what, what Moses was doing was striking God. God God's presence and provisions through, through this object. And, and there is something to, to leadership and disobedience, too, that, that, that's at work here. Moses is told to speak to the rock. He, he doesn't. He disobeys. And as a result, the punishment is you're not, you're not going in to the promised land. But one of the things we know about God is that he doesn't cut Moses off. Moses disobeyed God. God meted out punishment as a result, telling Moses, you're not going into the promised land. And the relationship continued. But it's Moses' response that, that I want to talk about this morning. It's, it's not so much whether you think the punishment's too harsh. It's not so much even that Moses doesn't get to the promised land. It's Moses' response to what God is telling him. Moses could have been bitter. Moses could have been angry. Moses could have said, wait a minute, I, I've spent my life serving you. I have walked with these people through thick and thin for 40 years. And the one time that I mess up, the one time that I make a mistake 
You're not going to allow me to see the promised land? I think about how maybe you and I would have felt if we were Moses in that situation. I mean, what, what would have been going through your mind? What, what, have you been, what have you been anxious about it? What have you been, been bitter? Would that have somehow maybe turned you away from your walk with God? Would it have made you think that, that all the years you spent leading these people were worthless and that it, it didn't amount to anything just because you didn't get to see or, or complete this last part? I, I ask those questions because I think about what is in front of us right now. There is so much to be anxious about. There is so much to be fearful about. There is so much to be frustrated about. But, but one of the things that happened is, is God takes Moses up and he gives Moses the long view of things. Moses is taken up on this mountain and he gets to see it. He gets to realize that God's faithfulness is, is there. God's provisions are going to be there. And for Moses, that was more important than just going and being at the scene of the promised land. His concern was that God was going to raise up another leader to lead the people. And I think about the times that we're in right now, and sometimes we would be well served to take the long view in situations like these. We would be well served to get above the fray and to look for those things where we see God working no matter what's happening right in front of us. There is so much potential for risk and for anxiety and for worry and for fear. I mean, how, how many of you have been wondering this past week, am I, am I going to get the coronavirus? Am I going to get sick from this? My daughter asks me almost every day when I come home from work at the hospital, Daddy, are you sick? Daddy, are you going to get sick? I know she's anxious about it. I, I know people are anxious about their jobs. I know people are, are worried as to what is the next day going to look like? What is the next week going to look like. I know there's people in our church family who have been furloughed from their work. I know there's people in our church family who are unsure if, if the job they've been working for 20 years is going to be there next week. I, I know there are people who are angry about all the work that they've done to get their company or to get their business to a certain place, and through no fault of their own, the potential that it could come crashing down and, and cease to exist. I understand that there's a lot of anxiety, that there is a lot to worry about. I understand that we're asking questions. When are we going to get out of this? When, is this? when is this going to end? And church, I, we don't know the answer to any of those questions. I'll tell you, though, that there is something to taking the long view. The Bible tells us that God took Moses up on the Arabim mountain region and, and I don't know what the Arabim mountain region is for you. I, I don't know what that place is for you that God takes you up on a mountaintop. I don't know what that looks like for you. But, but I, I get the sense that if we could just step away for a moment or a time and take the long view of what God is doing, then there would be several things you and I would notice. We would notice, number one, that God is faithful. We would notice, number two, that God is has never left us, that he is always with us, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes, even when we feel like he's not there. We would notice that God's provisions are going to continue on, even in spite of what we're seeing happening. And, and when you come back down, you can't stay on the mountaintop forever, but when you come back down, what a different perspective you arrive with to look at the season that we're in right now. For me, communion has, has always been one of those mountaintop experiences. The opportunity to take the step back and, and get the long view of God's faithfulness in my life, God's faithfulness to our church family, God's faithfulness to all believers, that he is preparing a place for us, that there is a, a time when Christ is going to return, and, and there is an exit strategy that God has for all of us in the midst of this mess. This week, I, I want to encourage you to think about what, what, what does getting away and, and getting up on the mountain somewhere look like for you? To get to a place where you can step back and, and look for God's faithfulness in the midst of, of everything that's happening. There's another story at work here too in Numbers 27, and it's found in verses 18 through 23. Moses has been told 
You're not going into the promised land. You can look at it. You can see these lush green pastures from afar, but you're not going in it. And Moses' response was an anger. Moses' response was, it's not fair. Moses' concern was for the children of Israel. God, that you'd raise someone up who can lead them and they're going out and lead them and they're coming in. And God hears Moses' request. Look what verse 18 says. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out and at his command, they will come in. And notice Moses, what he does. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. It really is a, a beautiful finish to what could have been a very frustrating and, and situation that was filled with anger. I, I look at Moses' response, and even in the midst of what I, I'm sure was, was hurtful to Moses, even in the midst of, of what I'm sure made Moses feel a little anxious about not going into the promised land, there was the opportunity for discipleship. There was the opportunity for equipping. There was the opportunity for strengthening and for building up. And I would tell you, church, don't minimize this time. Don't look past this time for you as a family, for you as an individual, to strengthen those people around you, to equip those people around you, to invest in those people around you, to disciple those people around you. Because in a very weird way, when we get past this, and we will, when we get past this, we may look back at this time and realize what a tremendous opportunity it was to step away, to get up on a mountain somewhere, and to see how God has been faithful and what God is asking us to do. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how it speaks to us. We thank you for how it, it guides and directs us in life. And Father, so often in, in this life, we, we face situations that can bring anxiety and bring worry, that can cause frustration, Father, that, that can maybe even make us angry. And God, I, I thank you that in your word, we see people who, who maybe face similar situations that could bring out similar emotions in our life. And Father, their, their response was not one uh, of of a human response, Father. Their one was really one that was, was divine in so many ways. Lord, I, I pray this morning for people who are struggling with what they're seeing and who are feeling anxious. I pray this morning for those who are worried about their jobs, worried about their health, worried about what might be coming next. I pray this morning for our, our leaders and God, I, I get that it's easy to be critical of the decisions they're making or, or the statements that they make. But Lord, we pray for them. We lift them up to you. As a community of believers, Father, we, we want to, to honor their decisions. And Father, we want to set an example as believers, particularly during this time. I pray this morning, Father, for those who do not know you. Lord, for those who may be watching this and and who are unsure as to how all of this is going to end, Father, I pray that in Christ Jesus, Lord, they, they would see where their hope can be found. Father, ultimately, our, our hope is not in everything in this world working out rightly. Our hope is in the life that is to come. And I thank you so much for the mediator, for Jesus Christ, who lived and died and walked among us, so that we might have life. Father, as, as we take time today to remember his sacrifice, as we take time today to remember what he has done for us, Lord, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit would go before us. 
I pray that, that in ways that even would go beyond our own understanding, that we might be refreshed in our relationship with you. And Father, that we might be able to found the, the Arab mountains in our life where we see your faithfulness and we see your goodness at work. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be gathered as your church. Even though it's, it's not in the ways in which we would want, I thank you that we're still able to gather. And I thank you that your Holy Spirit, who is at work in all of our lives, continues to lead, guide, and direct us. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Church, we are going to be observing communion this morning. And we had sent a note out earlier this week about how we're asking you to observe it with us. And as I share a little bit about communion with you, I'm going to invite you to go ahead on and get the elements ready. If you have grape juice to go ahead on and get that ready, if you have bread to get that ready, if you don't have those elements, then find a cracker or find a cup of water and, and put it before you, and we're going to observe communion together. I think about Paul when he was writing in 1 Corinthians, what he wrote to the church in Corinth, helping them understand how important it was to find their, their spiritual unity. And so often the things that, that separate us, the things that divide us as individuals, and sometimes even as a church, are things that pale in comparison to the unity that's found in coming to the table of Christ. Paul was writing to them, and, and he said that he had received from the Lord Jesus what he was passing on to them, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread with his disciples in the upper room and, and he broke it. And he, he illustrated for his disciples that this bread that was in front of them was going to be Jesus' body that was broken for their sins and for the sins of the world. He invited them to take and to eat of it. The Bible tells us that a short time later, after supper, he took the cup of the new covenant and he said, this is my blood which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it. And, and this has been passed on to churches throughout the centuries. There is a lot that separates us this morning from being together, but we can spiritually commune together as well by coming to this table, by recognizing that the Holy Spirit is involved. I mentioned earlier that we have a limited number of people here this morning. I've asked Mitch and Eric to participate in communion as well as we all join together virtually in observing the Lord's table. So what I want to ask you to do this morning is I want to invite you to take your bread, whatever that looks like, and to remember that as you partake of it, that this is the body of Christ which has been broken for you, been broken for me, been broken for us, been broken for this world. I would invite you to take and, and eat it. And whatever cup you have in front of you. I would invite you just to spend a moment looking at it and to recognize how Jesus described this, that he described it as his blood, which has been shed for you, for me, for us, for this entire world. And to think about not only what this represents, but the motive behind it, that this is coming from a place of love. Love from a Savior who desires so much to have a relationship with you. Would you take and drink it? Church, as you go throughout this week, may you be reminded, particularly as we have partaken of the bread and cup, may you be reminded that you are loved. May you be reminded that God is with us. May you be reminded that there's benefits to getting away and getting above the fray and taking the long view. I'm going to ask Eric to leave us with our benediction. God bless you, church. Have a great week. Church, our benediction this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And it should be a familiar passage, but 
I encourage you this morning to think about it in, in the context that we're all in, being separated from each other, but also being drawn together in and through Christ's spirit and being reminded of who we are and whose we are and the safety uh, that comes in uh, humility and, and the giving up of control over our lives to receive the, the joy that God has for us uh, in his presence. And uh, this comes from Philippians, starting in, in chapter 4, verse 4. Hear this benediction. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Go in peace.